Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, How to Turn Your App into Your Best Salesperson, brought to you by Front Egg. I would like to introduce our presenters. First, we have Aviad. He has been a developer for the last 20 years. He held a few management and architecture positions on startups, such as Vicon and HTS, as well as in larger companies such as Nice and Checkpoint. Today at Front Egg, Aviad works closely with many customers to help them build their SaaS solutions. Now, Stav. Uh, Stav is an experienced in product management with a focus on SaaS B2B products. She is a professional in transitioning companies from sales-led to product-led structures, which allows them to grow fast and support multiple sales channels. Today, Stav is also a mentor for product managers and founders who are looking to build products that sell themselves in the B2B area. Now, without any further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters. Hi, Aviad. Hi, Stav. So thank you for coming to this uh, important kickoff meeting. Um, today, I want to talk to you about the most important initiative we have for the company this year, which is how to turn our app into the best salesperson. What, what, what do you mean the best? We already have salesperson. Yeah, I know we have salesperson and they're great, but let me ask you something. Like, how do you feel when someone is trying to sell you something or uh, write you a LinkedIn message and trying to tell you about a new service that you they want you to buy? How did it, does it make you feel? So, you know, I get like a few of this every day and, and usually like I turn them down. Uh, I don't take such calls. Wow, every day is a lot. And like, uh, what makes you listen to someone or want to buy a specific service? So normally I, I prefer to, to, to talk to someone right after I, I can experience the product myself. So I like to free trial uh, into the product and then I'm willing to talk to someone. Great. So okay. this is exactly the reason um, I want us to do this important initiatives because most of the people like to try before they buy. They don't want to talk to a salesperson. They want to experience the value by themselves. And this is why we have to convince customer to pay for the service before they talking to someone. Look at the best growing companies, the best PLG companies. They all allow you to try something, to experience a value, and only after you understand the value and you have an intent to purchase, you're talking to a salesperson. But PLG, you said, what is PLG? Is it like a new technology? No, Aviad, it's not a new technology. PLG is a product-led growth. It's an end-user-focused growth model that relies on the product itself as a primary driver for customer acquisition, conversion, and expansion. Actually, studies show that product-led companies grow 30% faster. All right, 30%. You got me at 30%. So, so you got me. In, what do I have to do? Okay, great. So I want to start by just like letting you know what the discovery I did in order to understand what are the main things we need to do. So I looked at the best salesperson and I tried to understand what makes them so good. Like what are the skills that they have that we have to replicate in our product? The second thing, I look at the, the PLG growing companies, the best companies today that already succeed in turning their product to the best salesperson. And what is common to all of them? And after gathering all this information, I've come with the top three elements that we have to do in order to turn our product to the best salesperson. And what I want us to do today is to cover the three of them, to understand what we need to do, and now and then to understand from you what are the te technical needs from the technical aspects, everything we need to do, what are the risks, what are the best practices, and that's it. Okay, sounds good, let's go. Great, let's start. So the first thing we need to do is a best salesperson is first of all is delightful. He has a great positive first impression and this is something we also need to establish in our product. We need to, a, a good salesperson is someone that you want to listen to him. He looks like a trusted person. He is, a, a, he's, he's great, he makes people like want to, look at him, listen to him, everything. So we have to make our product 
the same. And the first thing we have in our product, the first first impression is a sign up form. 69% of people form a first impression of someone before they even have a chance to speak to them. This is exactly the sign up form. Before you experience a value or know something about the product, you first need to fill the sign up form. So the first thing we need to do is to remove the password from our sign up form. Aviad, listen, like this creates so many friction in the process. And studies show that like removing and moving to passwordless it can improve uh, our sign up rate in more than uh, 44%. So okay. what do we need to do? So so maybe we start with a few questions on on you know what exactly do you mean by by signing up and passwordless. So you know there, there are some factors that we need to take into consideration. For example, what is the unique identifier you want to keep for your users? Do you want to store emails? Do you want to store phone numbers? Do I need to choose like only one? So uh, I'll tell you that. I mean, uh, emails can walk through all the other systems as well, where, you know, phone numbers is a bit more intrusive. People don't like to hand out phone numbers. I suggest we start by email because that's like the B2B um, common practice and then providing a user to add phone number in the future. Okay. And when you talk about passwordless, so what kind of passwordless method do you want to go? There, there are two like common flows uh, around one-time code or magic, uh, magic link. Uh, and obviously, do you want to do you want to support SSO as well? Like login with Google, login with what GitHub. Is the, what is the one-time code? What is the difference between the one kind one-time code and magic link? So the one-time code basically means that you're providing your email, you click on send me a code, I'm going to send you a code through your email address, uh, and you're going to input that on, on the next string, uh, where with Magic Link, I'm going to send you a, a code through Magic Link, you're going to press on the Magic Link, and it's probably going to open on, on a new tab. Uh, Wait, but if I, I like send you a link, a Magic Link, can I pass this link to other users and then users that I didn't invite can enter my system? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So that's that's exactly uh, brings me to my next question. I suggest that we enforce that the same device that you ask the code or the link on will be the device that you are using it. So that will be like a best security practice to make sure that you are not like the link is not sent to another device. But it sounds like it's like for the experience is not so comfortable because if I'm, for example, getting the link and I open the link from my email and it's automatically open like a default browser that is not the current browsers that I'm using. So it can it might frustrate the, it frustrates the user, no? Correct. So this is why I think one time code will be best for user experience in this scenario. So in one time. I'm getting the code and I'm not getting out of the app. That's correct. And then we need to decide, so what is the expiration of the code? So you, how long do you have to, in order to input the code where, you know, shorter codes uh, are better for security, shorter expirations are better for security, where longer expiration is better for UX, but it's damaged security. What is the best practice based on your knowledge? I would go with probably around up to five minutes, not longer than that. It gives like the user enough time to, to go to the phone, to look for the code, even to be distracted for a second. Uh, and, and yet like develop on the UX side, if they input like a code, which is expired to, to let them ask for a new code. Okay. Sounds great. And when we talk about SSO, so what what SSO providers? Because that's that's another part that you wanted to talk about the the, the login with Google, login with GitHub. What SSO providers do you want to support? So first, I love SSO social login. I think it's best with the, in everything related to user experience because in one click you immediately get into the product, and you also don't feel you need to provide extra personal information to a vendor you don't know nothing you know nothing about. Um, so I love it, I, but I think like we we need to to have like between two to four 
social logins, not more because it's confusing for the user. So I've checked what are the most common uh, third party services our users uh, usually use. And I think like Google and GitHub and Microsoft is the best ones that everyone's have and uh, and we need to use them as a social login. Perfect. Cool. So so we'll tick on we'll tick on, on that once. And and in terms of scoping, so normally we ask for email and password. Is it like any any other scopes that you wanna that you wanna ask on the on the overflow? What do you mean by scope? I don't know. For example, you can ask if you're logging in with Google, you can ask for a list of contacts, a list like access to the calendar. I would advise, by the way, on the sign up screen against it, because that kind of frightened the user who knows nothing about the product. So maybe if you need that, we can we can do it later. But uh, uh, but that's yeah. that's. Not I agree. I think like um, let's minimize the the things that we want from the user in the first step, and maybe after that, when we need to, for example, we ask him to invite users or something like that, we can connect to his contacts or something. Perfect. Cool. And last question on on this SSO part. Um, normally, when you do log in with Google um, on on Google Chrome, now there's a new experience out there which is called OneTap. Uh, and that allows, like, because Google Chrome is very popular and login with Google is very popular, that allows like a one-click login without redirects or without pop-ups. Is that something that you want us to support? Love it. Great. Yeah, I want it. Cool. So, so we'll add it into into the timeline as well. So, so if I think about the takeaways from this one, um, so we're gonna implement emails as the unique identifier. That's probably the best practice for SaaS applications, B two B applications. Uh, passwordless basic implementation is gonna gonna do through one time code for better UX. We're gonna verify the send device uh, for security purposes. Uh, we're gonna implement privacy first and choose only email and and, and profile as the, as the scopes for the SSO. Uh, and we're gonna throw in there a one tip login to to make sure that our Google Chrome users can log in quicker. Perfect. Uh, Sounds great. So. Aviad, there is another thing I want in order to make our product, our sign-up form delightful. delightful. Uh, I want us to create powerful design and copy. Um, because like some things that when someone is coming to our sign-up form, he also needs to understand why he should start a sign-up. What is in it for him? Um, what is the value? So I want us to build like a marketing section inside the sign-up form, but a place where the marketing can change uh, what they write there or or images or something, but with no code. I don't want them to be dependent on the developer's team. So I want something like that. Like um, I prepared a, like a Figma, which uh, I have in one place a sign-up form, but in the next place I have like a, a one customer that's telling why uh, he should work with our solution and also logos of our uh, solution. And I want the marketing to be able to change the text all the time. I don't want it to be like um, something that uh, is sticky. Okay, sounds good. So so a few questions on this. Uh, which resolution do you want to support for this? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and which devices? Is it like mobile? Uh, what kind of resolution do you want to support? So great question. Uh, my UX uh, uh, designer will uh, provide you like exactly um, the screen resolution, which the split is uh, relevant. But for mobile, we will only uh, only work with a uh, with uh, uh, the form, the sign up form. But for the uh, for a larger screen, we can work with a split uh, sign up uh, design. Cool. And how about motions? Do you want to support like motions of of disappearing and not disappearing, maybe? Yeah, I love motions, but um, we need to be really careful with that because um, we need to do it right so that it will not like anno be annoying to the user. And also, uh, doesn't it affect like the the performance, like the the load time of? The yeah, page? so that brings me to you know that brings a, a whole set of questions on on if we can think about we want to have marketing full control on the content. So, you know, marketing are not developers, so they can 
maybe uh, destroy the entire load of, of, of the page with, with better HTML. How about providing them with some templates that we approved by developers for, uh, for that content? Yeah, I think you can go with that. Like we can have like between two to three templates. Cool. Uh, we can... And we want to provide them like remote access to the content, right? So we don't want the developer within the flow. No. No, I want it to be super fast and a lean process. So if I think about my takeaways from this one, uh, is that obviously I'm going to use CSS breakpoints to, to, to allow like this mobile responsiveness. Uh, the developers like to use uh, REM on pixels. Uh, and we're going to minimize the number of animations that we're going to use to improve the load of the page. Uh, and working with marketing, we're going to build like a CMS approach that they can inject uh, the templates uh, and we're going to monitor uh, the page load through heavy images and bad HTML so we know how to fix that in uh, right in time. Great, great. So Aviad, after we cover the, uh, the, the first part, um, the delightful part, I want us to move to the attentive part. So... I think one of the best uh, skills that good salesperson have is the ability to listen to people. Um, they don't treat everyone the same. They understand that each user, each, each persona is unique and have his own needs um, in the product. And it's really related also to the product itself and to the approach of looking at, at the business as not business to business, as, uh, but as business to human. Understand that each human has his own needs and want to experience a product in the way it's convenient to him and not necessarily as the rest of the people in his organization or in other organization. And users want to do things by themselves. They don't want to be dependent on you in each time they want to change something in the settings. So I want to allow them self-customization, making the journey there, like making it yours. They decide how they want to experience a journey and also people that are really, really invested and make it personalized to them have much higher intent to convert uh, in the end of the day. So I want us to create like a self-configuration and settings, an area where the user can set his privacy and security preference. For example, he can decide if he wants a multi-factor authentication when he, when he log in to the system, if he want to log in with a fingerprint or he wants to log in with uh, SMS. He can uh, invite users, assign roles. He can configure SSO to his organization. And he also can create web books and start playing um, with the product and, and uh, match it to his needs or, or adding integrations to other system by himself. Make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. We'll take care of the privacy and security. I have few questions on the team management part where they invite your user. So do you want to allow each of the users to belong to one account? Like we're forming accounts, right? When we invite another user, do you want each user to belong to one account or multiple accounts? Wow, it's a very great, good question. Um, actually, I, ha I, I need him to be related to multiple accounts because sometimes a user is like um, an outsource or a reseller or something, and he belongs to many accounts, not only to one. So yeah, I want the ability to invite him to more than one account and that he can see from his dashboard that he can go between accounts, between different accounts after signing up. Cool, sounds good. And and how about the the, the, the actual invite? Is it like, do you, wanna, do you wanna do it through email? Or do you wanna do it like through a reusable link? For example, in Slack communities, there is a reusable link that everyone can 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 join through, but it's less secure with email, yeah. with like a one-time link that uh, only the, the actual user can get and, and, and use only one time. I really like the link option. I see it in the most, like in the best collaboration products. Uh, and I think it, it's best. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the security, like, can they share the link with others? Like the link yeah. can go everywhere. That's a problem with reusable links. You can you can add like a certain level of mitigation on it, but uh, I don't know expiration thirty days, seven days, three days, one hour. But still, I mean, uh, uh, there is a security issue over there. 
can I, for example, decide who are the users that can log into my system? Yeah, so what we can do is maybe to limit like the, the access to specific domains and mm. that might uh, uh, wrap around it. Okay. Cool. Um, and, and when we talk about sending over emails, I mean, uh, which email compatibility do you want to support? Do you want to do you want to support on the web? I mean, I know like from previous position I held that there was a real issue around sending uh, emails through Outlook, you know, sending images, sending a bad form to HTML. Um, this this concerned me. If I invite someone in the email, it, it like it has to be... Uh, it can, should support the all type of emails because I don't know what email the, the email provider the user is using. Yeah, cool. Best practice is not, you know, to send huge images and to use like uh, well formatted HTML. Um, uh, there are great tools to check email compatibility as well. So we, we can we can definitely walk around it. And we discussed the invitation token. So if we're sending it by email, we're probably going to leave uh, up to one day. For better for better secure mixture of security and UX, uh, and they're gonna be used only once. Cool. So so if I if I collect all my takeaways from from uh, this team management, so we're gonna plan ahead. We're gonna keep. We're gonna build a user management system that can accommodate user uh, into multiple accounts. Um, and we, when we invite the user, we're gonna we're gonna keep the uh, the invite link as one time. We're gonna we're gonna reduce the risk of letting the same uh, link be used again and again. And we're gonna think about email compatibility. We're gonna take into considerations like all clients through like uh, like Outlook, etc. And we're gonna keep the the invite link long enough, but still short to to have a based mixture of, of security and UX. Okay. Cool. And, and, when, and you talked a little bit stuff about authorization and role management. So I have a few questions on this as well. Uh, do you know how many roles you're gonna you're gonna have uh, like within the year in the product? Is, is yeah, the currently, list currently, I have like a closed list of three roles, but um, it will definitely change in the future. Like I believe it will have more and more roles, and as uh, actually specific customer might ask for a specific role that we don't have today. Okay, okay. So that means that the role probably is gonna is gonna be an open list. So that means that we're probably gonna map the list of permissions, right? I mean, uh, we, we, we cannot support only roles. Uh, yeah. and, and how about levels? For example, I mean, uh, is an admin superior for an operator, which is superior for a viewer? Why do I need it? I, uh, for security best practices, obviously, we, we don't want an operator being able to hand over an admin roles because they are operators. So if we are taking like the self-service into the equation, uh, providing like an operator the ability to, to hand over admin roles, basically causes false elevation. Mm. Okay, so yeah, we definitely need that. Cool, so 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 I need to think about that as well. So if if I gather all of this into my takeaways, um, I probably gonna plan ahead and allow each user to have multiple roles and I'm gonna protect my APIs like on the get-go uh, to be protected based on permissions, and I'm going to do the mapping to, to roles and permissions in order to allow this flexible model of roles. Even if we are not doing it on day one, we're going to plan for levels. So we're going to protect like roles elevation, and we allow, we're going to allow context on roles to provide this, uh, this uh, multi account, multi roles uh, idea of, of, uh, of permissioning. Okay, great. Um, sounds like a lot of work and very complicated solution, um, but it's necessary. Uh, the third thing and the last thing that I want us to focus on is confident. Um, so, yeah, it might be obvious, but like when you share information and close a contract with a vendor as a business, you need like to trust the vendors that you are closing a deal with. And the salesperson should be someone that you really, really trust him. 
and you all the time try to to ask him question to make sure he stands in the level of uh, confidence that you need lack of trust is the main reason to lose a deal like companies come with a checklist of security and compliant things requirements that you must uh, meet them and what i want us to do is like try to take this checklist of the B2B buyer and add it to the product. So when the buyer is starting to use to try our product, you already get answers and like check marks or the things that he looked for in everything related to security and compliance. Make sense? Totally. Great. So um, I know security is the, is the best uh, topic for you. Um, so the first thing I want us to do is to increase trust during the sign-up process because when people come to sign up and share their private information, the email or other information, um, this is a, a situation where they don't know you at all. They have a, a lower intent because they don't know what they're going to get. And this is the place that we have to remove any concerns in sign up to the process. There are three things that allow us to eliminate uh, the fear of sign up to our product. The first one is to add a term in, uh, of use and privacy policy to our sign up form. The second one is to add recaptchas. They need to see the recaptchas. They need to see that we are dealing um, with fraud and with bots. And also um, to in the CTA bottom, we have to tell them that you can start a free trial but no credit card required they don't need to give up any information i want it just like the email and nothing else so they easily can sign up to our system cool sounds good so you know uh, i'm glad that you brought out the capture I, I personally look like uh, for, on any sign up i look for the capture icon mm -hmm. to, to make sure that you know this is it is but uh, uh protected which kind of UX do you want to... There, there are a couple of types for recapture, especially these days. There's the checkbox one, there's the images one. And, and, and these days there is... The the one that I, when, you do, when you click on things, like you try to solve something. Yeah, totally. There's this one as well. And in these days, there's a, a, the one that I preferably be, uh, really like, which is the invisible one, because, you know, there, there are like a lot of a lot of information about how like the recapture uh, with you know you fill the fill this Lego or complete this image actually reduces the the sign up conversion so uh, how about invisible recapture but the, like how invisible recapture works like how it uh, because when you ask the user so you check his real how it works in the so like... invisible recapture is actually kind of a magic where um, Actually, there is a score that is being collected through the recapture engine. Uh, uh, and this score is basically the likelihood of you being a bot. Uh, but that poses another issue where if mistakenly the recapture engine detected you as bot, uh, that means that you are not allowed to sign up and that causes another friction. Mm -hmm. So we might want to think about doing the recapture invisible that will be great for i don't know 95 percent of our users and still we might want to implement fallbacks in case that the user uh, was identified as bot maybe we need to implement a fallback engine what what, sure what does a fallback do like if i have a fallback? for example i mean in case you know 95 percent of the of the the users didn't have to feel anything and then if, if the user is detected as a bot, we can do a checkbox. We can do, I don't know, fire mm -hmm. hoses, do that kind of stuff. Okay. And, and, and about the terms of use, you mentioned that you want to have a terms of use and privacy policy. Do you have like a final version or you, you like, you do you think it's going to change frequently during the, the, the upcoming year or two? Yeah, so definitely it's going to change because like based on the GDPR and uh, like the privacy policy is for sure going to change because every new third party that we are working with, we need to update the privacy policy and and it, it changes all the time. So um, it needs to be, I want it to be changed like with no code. I don't want every time to open a Jira ticket to a developer to change the term of use. Cool. So for the no code part, I think we can we can go with the same approach that we that we had for, for, the, for the marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to plan ahead for this as well. 
uh, as well for the marketing content uh, to consent uh, that uh, that needs to be collected. So if I if I think about my takeaways uh, on this one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in uh, an invisible recapture with Foldex. Uh, the terms of use and privacy policy, we're going to do it like as a footer. We're going we're gonna to remove uh, checkboxes and that kind of stuff. And because that's probably going to change frequently, uh, I'm going to throw into the user management solution um, a mechanism that will track which user signed up on which terms of service and privacy policy version. So we might, you know, if we are updating the, the versions, we, we send notification to the relevant users. Uh, and we're going to build something uh, that will be able to keep uh, marketing consents based on location. For example, if the user came from the EU, they need to accept marketing consent. Uh, we know, I know that we are not sending much now, but if that changes in the future, we're going to build it into the sign-up as well. Perfect. Um, okay, one more thing we need to do um, to create like trust and to be confident vendor is to unhold the right to be forgotten. This is something um, users that are sensitive for privacy. This is one of the first things that they will look in our product, the ability for them to delete themselves and to ask us to delete every data about us. In many services, it's really hard to do that. Like you need to contact someone and it takes time and no one answers you. I want it to be like really self-served. Like when I click on delete account, it will make sure it will ask me with a confirmation dialogue if I'm sure that I want to delete it. And after that, the data, the personal data of myself will be deleted. Cool. So so when when we when you want to like provide a, the user the ability to, to delete themselves, I'm sure it's going to be for every logged in user, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you want to delete immediately? Do you want to give them like, I don't know, 30 days to, because that's a fact like what I'm doing, like hard delete or soft delete? Yeah, I need, I think we need to start with a soft delete and after 30 days to delete uh, completely because I'm afraid there will be some mistakes with this button and we still need the ability to to recover the data. Cool, so, so we're gonna give 30 days and then they want us to delete all the relevant that I don't know. We have uh, we have the support uh, tools, we have the the CRMs, we have logs, we have other stuff. Do, yeah. do we need to delete all the data from all the relevant systems as well? This is a must. We have to delete every data, every personal information that related to to the user. Also, if we're using fourth party, like the fourth party, every third party and fourth party that we are using, we must delete everything from the HubSpot from the mix panel, from uh, every service that we are using. Okay. And and how about adding a, another verification? Do, do you want to add like another verification uh, to this action? I know that, you know, in some of the cases you're required to have a specific role in order to delete an account. Can I use like the multi-factor authentication? Like yeah, multi-factor, super user, uh, super, uh, super user mode, yeah. Yeah, I think the multi-factor authentication here is super important. Cool. So, so in terms of my takeaways from this one, I'm going to probably implement a, a soft delete, store the data for 30 days. Uh, we're going to issue a webhook mechanism in order to delete all the information with third party. We're going to build uh, something around it. I suggest we're going to create an owner role to allow the deleting of the account. Uh, uh, and before the deleting the account, we're going to go into a verification mode, uh, extra layer of authentication, we're going to do through email, through MFA, uh, just to make sure that the user is actually uh, the user that they claim to be. Okay, so I know it's a lot, but I have one last, uh, one oh. last uh, request. Um, so I want to allow uh, SSO self-configuration um, SSO is part of the checklist of many, many companies that we try to target. They want to, to have the ability to log in with SSO. Uh, but I wanted to make it super simple. I want them to, to be able to configure as, as SSO by themselves. Um, so already when they sign up to our system, they know that they can configure SSO uh, and like also move the SSO from high touch to low touch. Not only self-service, they can test it by themselves, they can configure, they can change it, like something that will be super easy. 
and um, also to eliminate the support from our side, not be dependent on us so much. Cool. Uh, uh, and which SSR protocols do you want to support? There, there are two very famous ones. There is obviously the SAML, which is like the top uh, enterprise SSO uh, protocol. And now these days there's an open ID connect as well. Uh, do you want to support both? Do you want to start off? between them yeah so summit provides extra flexibility around uh, the extra claims that, that can be the groups the groups information the idp information uh, if you if you ask me like you know today in today's world like being a real enterprise ready uh, you you gotta have summit built in into your product so why do we need open id the open ID is like the new rising star. There are some uh, forms of, of enterprise, uh, for example, Okta is supporting uh, Open ID Connect by default as well now. So mm -hmm. that going uh, uh, and a lot, like some organizations prefer to use Open ID Connect for this one. Okay. So what do you think? Like what we need to do? I think we're probably going to implement both. We, can, we probably can start with SAML and add OpenID Connect per request, but uh, uh, SAML probably should be the one uh, to go uh, on the get-go. And, and that brings me to my next question. Uh, you know, SAML has two ways of configuration. There, there's the, the, the static configuration and there's the automatic magical configuration where the user basically on the self self just upload an XML file. I suggest because I've seen it in many, in, in many cases, I suggest that we support this as well. Yeah, wow, it sounds super cool. Like it's like uh, it happens automatically. You don't need to do anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, uh, you download the XML file, the metadata XML from the IDP, you just throw it into, into the product and basically the configuration is being propagated automatically. And do you think like customer can handle the, that by themselves? Yeah, yeah, that that you know, with with a specific guidance, yeah, they can hand, they can handle it uh, by themselves. Okay. And, and and obviously, you know, one one of the frictions I've seen with the uh, with SAML configuration is the ability to to first to test it because if a user is misconfiguring SAML uh, for a specific domain, that means that they can easily be locked out uh, wow. yeah. of the system, and that's 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 a real uh, hustle. So there are two ways uh, to walk around it. First way, I mean, we, we, we're going to let them probably test the configuration um, with them be like, uh, and only them, like then we're going to let them save after the test. Uh, and there's another way that we can think about is might maybe to let the owner of the account have another fallback authentication method, which is not true SSO. Uh, to log into the to the to the product so he can recover the account. This is this is a must, I think. Like the ability to 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 be able to log in also without the SSO, it's super important. Cool. Uh, and you know, today's it, it, like when you when you define an SSO for a specific domain, um, because that domain is being claimed, obviously, by the SSO, uh, I think that we need to verify that, that the, the user that is configuring the domain, especially if we're providing like self-serve mode and, and free signups, uh, we, we need to verify that the actual domain uh, is the actual domain of the user. So we can go easy and say, if you verified your email and you, you're probably using that domain, you can use it. Uh, another way to go is the more secure but less UX side uh, is to verify a domain through a TXT records, uh, and then we, we can do we can do it as well. Uh, so that's something the, you lost means are not the, not user friendly area. Um, yeah, but it's for better security, and there are a lot of companies that are doing that. Um, and, and the last one on, on best practice is the IDP first. So, you know, I was working for uh, for NICE uh, and for Checkpoint, and, and I hardly knew the URL of any product that I, I was using. I was logging into my IDP, and I've mm -hmm. seen all the products that I'm eligible to use. And I was clicking on that, and it redirected me to the, to the product itself. And you know, I speak with a lot of uh, a lot of developers in 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 these enter big enterprises, and they all use the same approach. 
they don't know the URL, they are, they are logging into the products through the IDP. So that's called the IDP first. Uh, and, I, and I, you know, that's that's something that we need to consider to support because it's it's a must-have probably for 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 a good uh, SAML and uh, enterprise SSO connection uh, integration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It sounds it sounds interesting, but super advanced. So uh, let's talk about it. Think uh, how we can uh, add it. Cool. So my takeaway from this one: we're gonna implement SAML. For start, we're gonna leave Open ID Connect based uh, for 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 uh, for another customer to 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 ask for it. And we're gonna think about the IDP initiated login. We, it's probably a must, but uh, let's talk about it. Um, domain validation is required. We're gonna take the the, the better UX uh, approach with the email validation. Uh, UX wise, we're gonna add an option to test the SSO. Uh, and we're gonna let uh, the customer upload their metadata XML so they can have uh, a super easy integration uh, on the get go. Okay, so it's a lot, I know, but I need estimation from you, Aviad, in order to understand. Like, I know uh, for me, like you are the best developer I know. You are a genius, so I know you can do it like really, 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 really fast. Um. So let no, me know. Come on, stuff. You know, you know, it's like more than uh, I can handle. It's gonna take like a team of between two or three developers around three to six months. That's crazy. I mean, this content yeah, is crazy. This is the most important initiative. Every day that we're not doing it, we're losing customers. I understand stuff, but you know, we need to do it right. That security. Let, let, let's let's do that. Okay. Okay. Give me a week. I'm going to search the market. Maybe there are like third party tools that can help us with some of the stuff. And then we can focus on, 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 you know, other initiatives as well. Do you think there is a third party, a service doing all of that? Yeah, there are. I'm sure there are. Wow. Okay. So let's meet a week from now and let me know if you find something. It can be amazing if we can like implement it in a, Two weeks. Wow, it can okay. be great. Sounds good. So um, I just like for the next step after we're doing this, I want you to know that the next thing I want us to talk about is start measuring everything because it's not enough to turn our product to the best sales pattern. We need to start measuring everything the user does and to iterate fast and also to provide some insights to the user during the journey. So we will talk about the analytics and visibility as part of the data, a part of the infra infrastructure. Sounds exciting. Yeah. Thanks, Aviad. It was a great kickoff. Sounds good. Any questions? Uh, we do have a few questions uh, from attendees. Uh, let's kick off with a question here. Um, how do you measure the impact of this initiative? Oh, um, okay. So um, first I have to say um, th the main thing here and the main goal that we have is to turn users to have like a, to sales qualified lead. What do I mean by sales qualified lead? Sales qualified lead, it means that they actually understand the value. They have a high intent to purchase a product and they're willing to talk about terms and the pricing, but they're already yours. They want the product, they're looking to buy it. Um, so this is the purpose, the goal. And for each company, the sales qualified lead defined differently. So some of them, like you need to experience a product and invite other users for a couple of days. For some of them, they did a specific thing in the product or invested some time, and then we decide that they're qualified. But you need to like take the users into the journey, decide what is the event that makes them sales qualified leads. And then this is the plate when the salesperson should do a touch point with the user and convert him to a paying customers or do it themselves, like with a self-service uh, payment, and then they pay by themselves with zero touch. Okay, thank you. We have a few more questions here. Uh, this one says, uh, you mentioned multi-factor authentication. Uh, what do you recommend to incorporate there? 
Wow, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, so the the so many types. So it totally depends on the type of customer. So first of all, I I I, uh, I always suggest to incorporate few of them. Uh, Google Authenticator uh, or such uh, TOTPs are by far uh, the most uh, intuitive and protective ones. Um, but you know, when you go to even to banks, you know, I keep saying that asking my mother to install a, a Google Authenticator on her phone uh, looks like crazy. So she's using SMS, although I explained uh, several times that SMS is hackable, uh, really easy. Uh, so I, I normally say do Google Authenticator as a get go. Um, and then you can you can do like you know the more advanced stuff, doing fingerprints, doing web of them, but Google Authenticator and 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 such like TODVs is probably a great mixture between UX uh, and security. It's really secure. Okay, looks like we have another question here. Uh, when should I use a hard delete and when should I use a soft delete? <sighs> Yeah, so I think by default, we should use soft deletes. Uh, that gives us a great transaction logs on, on, on what is deleted and when. Uh, and then we can, I don't know, clean up uh, or put it to a cold uh, warehouse if we are not required to actually delete, like if it's not PII. If there is a PII and we need to comply with GDPR and, and CCPA and that kind of rules, so eventually we're gonna to need to hard delete. Uh, so it really depends on the type of the data and the cost of the data. Um, so I would say by default, do soft delete. So you can recover at any point, unless it's PII and then uh, you need to hard delete eventually. All right, we have, looks like we have one more question about um, authentication. You mentioned domain authentication. How do you recommend doing that? So one of the common ways to do domain authentication uh, is through DNS. Uh, it's either a TXT record, the C names, uh, that actually proves uh, that the domain is, is, is really uh, yours. So you, you generate a 128-bit one, one uh, unique identifier. You ask the customer to, to, to add this uh, TXT record to, to the DNS, and then you're basically polling uh, the DNS to make sure that they actually added it. If they added it, that means that probably uh, the domain is theirs. Um, we just, you just need to keep in mind that once you generate this uh, unique identifier, it needs to be a really unique identifier. Otherwise, I mean, there is a risk of, of a domain uh, uh, mis, mis domain validation. Okay, and I think looking at the Q&A tab, we have one last question. Um, this one says, uh, this sounds like it's a company-wide effort. Uh, what other teams do you think should be involved in the process? Yeah, it's definitely like something that um, gather like multiple uh, teams in the organization. But the main partner we have here is the sales because we need to gather to convert as, as much customers as possible. Um, so I think like the best thing is to sit with the sales team and think what is the best time to start a touch point, to, to contact, the, to start talking with the user, to get a, a, a touch point with the user during the buyer journey. Um, not too soon, not too late. What is, and you need this product the developers like and, and the sales to think what is the best uh, point to do that um, the best thing if we did the, the job good uh, and um, we nail this project so people will will ask to contact the sales and not the sales we run after the user and this is the best uh, uh, situation because then the, the chances they will convert to customer is much higher Okay, that's the last question we have for today. So do you have any final words before we sign off? 
No, just uh, thank you, Stav. It was uh, it was a delight. Yeah, thank you. It was super interesting. All right. So with that, D Zone would like to thank both Stav and Aviad for an outstanding presentation. D Zone would also like to thank Front Egg for providing the audience with an excellent webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career.